quickly ask the questions that we have here. I'll ask these questions in two, so if you could briefly maybe cover those. So first and second question is, uh, is programming skills needed to integrate RSU to traffic signals? And the second question is, how do you define the user needs? Did you work with the stakeholders to identify the needs? So this is Blaine. Let me, let me attack the first one. Um, potentially, some programming skills are needed to be able to integrate the RSUs to the traffic signals. But it depends entirely on um, uh, the equipment you purchase. And equipment is, is getting more mature. So it's important that you ask that question um, of the vendor of your um, traffic signal controllers and talk to them about whether there are particular DSRC vendors they have relationships with and whether they can facilitate that data transfer or whether you need to work through it. We found that we needed to spend a fair amount of time doing that. Uh, others have found that it's a little more straightforward. So it just depends on the equipment, and you should have that conversation with them. And this is Dean. I'll, I'll address the second question, um, how do we define the user's needs? I'm assuming that's for the CONOPS. We work with a small group of, of individuals, Blaine and Ray included in it, of, of infrastructure owners and operators who had deployed connected vehicles to capture their needs on it. We also had the benefit of several concepts of operations and, and other support documents that FHWA had developed for, for the safety, connected vehicle safety research that had been done, as well as the uh, connected vehicle research implementation architecture, all of which um, included descriptions of the applications, included the needs they were addressing. So we, we kind of pulled all that together and came up with, with the kind of first set of, of model needs, model user needs. Uh, recognizing that for each site, you know, your user needs would be tailored from that, but that was kind of the sources where we, we came up with those. Thank you. Um, so next, uh, again, I think these two questions would be for you, Dean. So on one of your slides, on slide 46, you mentioned a minimum requirement to support the security group. Can you specifically uh, tell us what is required for that uh, security requirement. And also, the other question is, is red light violation warning the national minimum use case, or that is just for a particular state? OK, sure. I'll, I'll address these, and then I'll also see if Blaine or Ray want to chime in on the second one as well after I address it. So the first one, um, regarding 546 and, and the, the uh, security group, yeah, is Blaine, I think, did a good job of describing security. We're, we're in kind of a, diff, a, a challenging situation right now. Our understanding is that by the time um, passenger vehicles, commercial passenger vehicles out there would approach an intersection and receive the SPAT data, that will need to be uh, secured using a security credential management system in order for them to, to use that data. Right now, as, as Blaine said, that, that's not readily available with, with the federal system, with the national system. Um, it is coming in the future, though. Um, there are deployments right now that um, are interfacing with fleet vehicles, whether they be transit or, or others, and, and security needs for those are, are somewhat different. But we, we, we understand that there's, there's limits to what can be done now. There is a resource that um, is, is almost ready to be done, which is a brief four, kind of a four-page document of what the SPAT challenge responders should, should, should know now about the security credential management system. We're hoping that will address it. But um, I, I hope that kind of addresses the question and at least, at least describes the relationship between that and, and what Blaine had described. And then I'll address the second one um, regarding um, red light violation warning. Um, the question was whether it's a, a, a national minimum case or just a particular state. It, it's really, what it is is that when we first sat down and talked with some of the automobile manufacturers about this that challenge, they said in order to, to talk details about verification, validation, we need to center it around an application. And red light violation warning works the best because that's um, well-defined, well-understood. It's also an application that the infrastructure owner operator really doesn't do anything for other than just broadcast the SPAT data. The red light violation warning would all be self-contained on the vehicle, the application portion of it. So we, we use that kind of as, as the, the, the representative application as they de develop the verification validation document and as we develop the CONOPS. We wanted to go a bit further in the CONOPS, and that's why we called out the other applications, because we recognize that a lot of the states, like I think Ray phrased it pretty well, if he drives his boss out there, 
um, he, he needs to show something. So in their case, they're, they're equipping snow plows and possibly some transit vehicles and things like that. So we wanted to cover some other applications, but the red light violation warning was kind of the, the minimum thing that we could talk about in terms of what the vehicles need to receive in terms of a, a very basic minimum content. So that, that verification document is centered around red light violation warning. And Blaine, Ray, did, did I capture that correctly? Do you have anything else to add to that? I think that's uh, good. Yeah, one thing I'd add, the, the SPAT message and the MAP message, uh, most of the data elements in there are marked as optional. And that's why you need to know what applications you're thinking of. So uh, the red light violation warning probably uses mostly the mandatory things. But if you're going to do like pedestrian and crosswalk or some of the other things, you need other data elements in your messages that you wouldn't need just for red light violation warning. So uh, it is important to figure out what applications you're doing. And um, yeah, I don't know that there is a national minimum. You can uh, basically do whatever you uh, want to deploy. But the, we're hoping that it's, it's one that is likely to come out in cars uh, if there are V to I applications in cars. Thanks. Um, so the next two questions would be first, uh, can you tell us if there are any needs or demands for position correction emerging? And uh, the second question is, how do you plan to integrate the SRC into pedestrian applications as mobile phones are not equipped with the SRC? So this is Blaine. I'll take a stab at, at those. Um, <clears throat> we've had a fair amount of conversation among ourselves as infrastructure owners and with OEMs about position correction, uh, a GPS position correction, otherwise called an RTCM. And frankly, the jury is still out. Um, <clears throat> I think part of what the demand will be uh, will, will depend on the application. So does the application require a real accurate GPS or not? Um, in our application in, in Utah with, with the transit signal priority, we have not found a need uh, for a correction of the normal GPS message. If you're looking at crash avoidance with a pedestrian in a crosswalk, that may be a different story. Um, we're still working on that. Uh, most of us IOOs have not tried to deploy an RTCM yet. I believe they have in California. Um, and, 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 but I just think the jury is still out on that one a little bit. We're still trying to figure that one exactly. Um, as far as uh, pedestrian applications, um, uh, not a lot of people have developed those very far along yet. I know in the in one of the in the in the Arizona version of MITS, um, they have a pedestrian application, and they use a Wi-Fi connection from a cell phone to a device, a Wi-Fi device in the signal cabinet, and then that communicates with the DSRC device. I know there was at least one manufacturer of DSRC units that, uh, that, that sold a cell phone case uh, that had a DSRC unit in it. Um, I don't know if they still do that or if there's a market for that. Uh, but again, I think there's still some room for development in that particular question as we start to work with some of those applications and, and see how they may come together. And I would say also that uh, some of the Pedestrian applications just use the smartphone app through cell phone data rather than a, a DSRC. Uh, thanks. So the next questions uh, are, the first one is on the readiness of the technology. So the question is, how would you depict the readiness level of SPAT technology on a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being basic research and 5 being prototype? and 10 being uh, productized and market ready. And the other question is about the cost. So the cost range of uh, equipment purchase and deployment was fairly large. What is the range for just for the RSU equipment? So let me take those in backwards order. Um, the number I gave for RSU really is just for the RSU equipment. So. When you go out to buy a roadside DSRC unit, um, depending on your procurement process, the range in cost of that device will be about $1,500 to $3,200, give or take a little bit. I've gotten, I've gotten bids from vendors at both ends of that spectrum. And so that's just the RSU device. Um, readiness level of SPAT technology is an interesting question, and, and Dean and Ray can weigh in on this. Um, I believe that the hardware is probably at about a seven. 
and the uh, applications or the software is probably uh, about a four um, in general, if it's that. Um, Dean Ray, what do you think about that? So right now, uh, so NHTSA has a, a proposed rule making to put uh, V to V DSRC in vehicles. That does not require any V to I. Um, and it's not clear the future of that rulemaking even. So right now there aren't really vehicles, production vehicles out there receiving SPAT. So anything that you do is kind of what the agency puts their own vehicles out there and stuff. So given that, I would say, you know, f prototype would be uh, closer than uh, productized. Okay, um, so um, a question about uh, legal ramifications. So somebody asked if there has been any analysis into the legal ramification of broadcast of uh, SPAT data. Uh, and also we have a question about OBUs with two radios. So somebody asked if both of them are DSRC, and how could this be uh, potentially used in applications? So, Ray, do you want to take the legal question? Or want me to? I'll let you. I'm, I'm sure uh, people have asked the question. I don't know if there's an answer. Yeah, people have asked the question. If I'm an agency and I'm broadcasting SPAT data, and someone else is using that data, what's my legal responsibility for sharing that data? Uh, um, and I, I don't know of a particular analysis of that. I think individual uh, agencies, state and local agencies, need to grapple with that. Uh, there are a number of agencies who are now sharing their SPAT data uh, with companies uh, through, you know, directly as a link out of their control room, uh, not through DSRC, and some are hesitant to do that. Um, we obviously don't have any control over what someone does with SPAT data they may receive, uh, but I think that's an, an agency-specific issue you've got to tackle. Um, we've decided that we're okay sharing that, and, and we believe that the use of that data can save lives in the long term, and so we're okay with that. Some agencies may be a little more hesitant about that. The other question was about radios. Um, so... Um, most, most roadside units today have two radios in them. The DSRC spectrum, which is the 5.9 gigahertz spectrum, and I'm not looking at the map, so I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking out of my head here a little bit, has about seven different channels, and those channels have different uses. And sometimes as you're sending uh, SPAT data every, every tenth of a second and map data every second and receiving uh, uh, some other kind of a message from an OBU at the same time every tenth of a second, a BSM message, for instance, um, sometimes you want those to be on different channels. And so if you have two DSRC radios, either in the RSU or the OBU, you can send those on separate channels simultaneously, and it's just a cleaner transaction. That's probably an oversimplification of the real reason. But, um, and you can buy OBUs that, um, that only have one DSRC radio on board, and you can buy them that have two. Our MITS application, the way it was written, required two because we were sending multiple messages on different channels. Um, you can also buy DSRC units, particularly roadside units, that also have built into them other kinds of uh, uh, other other kinds of radios. So Wi-Fi, for instance, uh, one of the brands of DSRC that we purchased has about three or four different kinds of radios in it. So it's got like six antennas, um, seven antennas. Um, so um, if you, if you want a unit that can do more than DSRC broadcast, those are capable. Um, those units are available, and you might want to think through that. But it depends on the application. Thanks, Blaine. I'm going to ask the last two questions here. Um, so again, about the cost. So somebody asked that, does the engineering cost shown on Page 58, include costs for implementing security certificates? If not, what's your estimate for that? And the other question is about position correction again. So some a follow-up question on our previous 
uh, your, on your previous answer was that what about lane accuracy? Can you explain on that a little bit more? So the engineering costs that I provided do not involve um, integrating uh, SCMS at all, um, security certificates. Um, none of us really have ex none of us really have experience with that yet, and so we don't know exactly what it'll take to do that. With the exception of the three pilot sites, who are just now, I think, beginning to work with that. Um, so the costs I showed do not include that. And I don't have a good estimate for what that might be. Um, what about lane accuracy? Um, we found in our uh, units that are mounted on buses uh, that the GPS we get in the OBUs uh, is good enough to tell us which lane the bus is in. So it's giving us, it's giving us uh, um, a location within about a half a meter. And that's adequate for what we're trying to do in that particular application. I don't know if that was the intent of the question, but. Uh, this is Ray. You know, I think it depends on the application. Like Dane, uh, Blaine's doing the transit signal priority. If you're doing red light violation running and you have separate left turn signals, you might need to be able to know what lane you're in uh, to do that right. And the correction stuff, if the problem is you're, say, in a downtown canyon where you can't see the GPS units, then the GPS correction doesn't really help either. And I understand what the New York City pilot site uh, did is they had to build some dead reckoning and maybe triangulating off of roadside units to supplement the GPS to get good enough accuracy and they found they were able to do that. But whether you need lane accuracy depends on the application and the site, I would say. Thanks. Um, there's just one last question coming up, and this is like a debatable question, but I'm going to ask it. So uh, can you compare DSRC to 5G, and if there are two radios that broadcast both? Yeah, that, that's a complicated question that we could spend an entire webinar on, but let me summarize it this way. Um, <clears throat> 5G doesn't exist yet. 5G is a promise. Um, 5G is a concept. Um, the um, chip makers have just started to manufacture some prototype chips so they can test 5G. In its full capability, as promised, 5G is supposed to be very fast uh, and will compete with DSRC in its low latency numbers. Um, but, but they haven't been built and they haven't been tested. So you can't buy a 5G chip today. Um, and you can't buy a, a device with 5G antenna in it because uh, it doesn't exist. Um, we suspect that it'll take the industry a couple of years to do the kind of development and testing that they really need to do to demonstrate whether 5G really has the latency uh, that they claim it has. Uh, and then we believe it'll take several more years before the automakers are comfortable with its capabilities. One of the things that DSRC has done in the last five or six years has been through very detailed and broad uh, real live testing. And so in the safety pilot in Michigan, for instance, hundreds of devices were deployed on roadside and in vehicles, and demonstrations uh, were able to um, show that DSRC communications in a, in a complex and crowded environment can get back and forth and meet the latency requirements. That'll need to happen with 5G. My guess is that it'll be everything it's, um, it's supposed to be, and that in five to eight years, it'll start showing up in some of the cars. Um, and sooner than that, of course, it'll show up in cell phones. Um, they also need to build um, an antenna network, a small cell antenna network that has a pretty frequent deployment pattern. Um, and then we also have to start thinking as, as infrastructure deployers about the, the fee difference. So DSRC communications are free and we put them in cars and, those, and, and on the roadside, and those radio communications go back and forth for free. Um, 5G will be implemented by cell phone companies who usually charge a fee. And so if 5G is in your car or in your cabinet, there will most likely be a monthly fee associated with those communications. I like to compare it in a safety, in a safety evaluation um, to your airbags. If every time you got in your car, in order for your airbags to be useful, you had to put a quarter in the slot, how useful would your airbags be? And so we have yet to know whether 5G will be offered free 
for safety applications in our vehicles. Um, so um, we'll see how that comes together. But the fact, uh, the, the direct answer to the question is, you can't buy a device today that does DSRC on 5G. 5G doesn't exist. Um, DSRC does. Thanks, Blaine, for that answer. Um, I think uh, we have no more questions, and we are over our time. Um, I just want to take a moment and thank everyone who attended today's webinar, as well as our panelists who shared some good information here today with us. Uh, like I said in the beginning, a recorded version of this webinar, along with the presentation, will be sent to you in a post-webinar email as a follow-up. On behalf of National Operations Center of Excellence and our presenters, thank you for joining us today, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.